here we go. Going through the car routes that have been read and that the people here in the parking lot, studio audience, requested additional comments thereof, perhaps. And Kairut said, several of these tonight I think are verging on the uncommentable. And so I'll just reread a few of these. I say that because here's the first one. And Kairut quoted, quote, But Saul said he, what new physics through yon reality breaks? It is this life and I part of the equation. You do not have to be from the 1600s, <clears throat> even drugged this far to get the gist of that, do you? Guy down here said no, so good enough. Well, two of them. And Kyrick said, a man who believes that he has a serious mission in life and who also has 28 cats had better think again. Uh, let me leave again and suggest to you the idea of the operational division that we have been using between the primary and the secondary world. And assuming the man has 28 cats, not by accident, he just got up one day and suddenly there was 28 cats in his house, we'll assume that he purposefully, of his own volition, arranged to be a resident along with 28 feline friends. If that same kind of man Somebody would be that big of a cat lover, that big of an aficionado in a sense, even a second-handed aficionado of the primary world. If that man simultaneously believed that he had, you know, like voices from God or something, then we've got a real, shall we say, if you live next door to him especially, I'd say that you had a real interesting neighbor. <laughs> and so the Kairut is sort of saying that if the man, the play with justice, if he could believe he had a serious calling in life and of his own volition, of his own free will, had 28 cats that he should think again. The insinuation being that that man should at least take a large rubber band and put it around here and you know, let it go and say, snap out of it. <laughs> he better think again. Uh, and Kairut said, a three-eyed man in a two-dimensional world often sees shadows preceding events. Uh, if you're ordinary, right quick, I guess you could say, well, hey, that just, finally this cockamamie show is admitting that there are such things as paranormal or metaphysical or whatever, occult abilities to divine the future. How about the fact that the whatever I'm assuming that Kairut means here a two-dimensional world that he is speaking obviously in the intellectual sense that that's all it takes for a man to run intellectually although from the bare minimum speaking spatially and physically then we'll all agree as if we had a choice unless you've been shot that we live in a three-dimensional world but two dimensions are all that are required consciously for an ordinary mind to live so on that basis, which I would also suggest, again, is the kind of hormonal, electrochemical basis that gives rise to these strange, vaporous dreams of uh, parapsychology and the paranormal, and etc. But, talking about the mind operating and only requiring a two-dimensional universe in which to properly exist and flourish at the ordinary city level, a man with three eyes, a man that could see, back to one of the descriptions we used to use of uh, on the A, B, and C forces, that there are three things going on. And at the very minimal, you're seeing two things going on, opposing forces, pros and cons, the, you know, the Whigs and the Tories and Democrats and Republicans and the Jews and the Arabs and the Protestants and everybody else, up and down, right and wrong, good and bad. They are functioning quite well. That's all it takes for a two-dimensional world to exist. But what if a man stumbled through there that could not only see the two forces driving everything that seems to be necessary to be driven to keep the secondary, to keep the uh, two-dimensional secondary world going here, what if he had three eyes and he could see not only the apparent battle going on, it comes up again in another sense if we get around to it, that the true definition of life is not the words on the paper, it's the paper. That in a sense it is the background 
What if a man could see not only what seems to be the struggle going on, but he could see, let's just call it the background, since we've done it before. So if you're going to plagiarize, steal from the best. He could see the third part. I suggest to you it's from such areas as that, but quite basic crude reality in a non-normal sense. It comes the ideas of, let me see, if I could only get my migraines back, perhaps I could become a fortune teller again. If this tumor gets any larger, perhaps I'll be able to tell the future. Uh, the idea, you know, this one says, a three-eyed man in a two-dimensional world could often see shadows preceding events. Then it sounds like, well, all right, they are, in a non-judgmental way, everything portends what's going to happen. That everything is a dead giveaway. That's easy to say. It was. Huh. I'd been frightened, but it was. I, I'd been wanting to do it. It's not quite that simple. You could make a whole philosophy out of that, and surely somebody has. That yes, everything foretells something about itself. And I'm sure in the city, the area of philosophy, or at least non religious, there have been people who did not even attribute it to any sort of unusual mystical forces it would just say well if you study such if you studied the election we're here in an election year in America circa 92 that if you studied all of the ramifications socially economically and you looked at the candidates and you listened to what was going on that in a very non-mystical way very hard-nosed hard-headed beady-eyed that you could in some way begin to see that current events foretell what's coming up. Well, it's good that dead people mainly say that. That's where philosophy comes from. That's where wisdom comes from because it will not hold up with ordinary people if they are alive. But sure, you can do it once. And that will not even make you famous long enough you know, to wipe the sweat off of Warhol's tombstone because you cannot continually do it. You can say things, you can get on a talk show, or you could be interviewed and be an area, an expert, apparently in some city area of economics, politics, and make a prediction. Well, I'm going to say, and especially if you gave it a little small, abstruse sounding preface about, well, based upon the demographics of the way the voting polar polarities of this country has shifted and uh, this being the year of the woman and there being so much attempt to empower the inner cities wherein the tax base has struggled to move further over the horizon and, there we go. <laughs> and then the guy says I say, I say believe it or not that you are going to be very surprised at what that third party nine traditional candidate will do and if he does the guy goes uh huh and somebody at the station one reporter might remember him for a few seconds like hey he said that but that's it there is no, at the two-dimensional level, with two-dimensional minds, there is no continual predicting of the future. And I don't mean just mystically, even on the basis of what seems to be statistically, non-mystically. Ordinary minds, if you've got a two-dimensional mind, if you're a two-eyed man in a two-eyed world, if you predict the future and it comes true, hey, bronze it. <laughs> put, put it on your mantle. Be sure you get it on tape so that you can show it to all your friends over and over and over and over. <laughs> Because that was it. I went through all that just to point out that it is not as simple as it might sound just at first hearing of a three-eyed man in a two-dimensional world often sees shadows preceding events. Uh, I am not trying to naysay Kairu because it is true. It's not on the basis of, well, I have such superior consciousness or insight or intelligence that I can tell the future. Well as they used to sing on the mystical playgrounds of Arkansas, you may tell the future, but you can't tell it much. <laughs> Just like the Germans. And, uh, don't any of the pro-future society write me and say that I should not be comparing Germans with the future. Because we all know how that has worked in the past. There has historically been a few groups that now and then attempt to hijack the future and hold it hostage. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> Along the same area, but I will read this one because it didn't seem to go over real 
directly when it was read. And Kairut said, a more creative and original rebellious part of one man's intellect told another more ordinary part of his intellect. It said, quote, if, as many believe and call it, the ultimate battle, religiously good and evil, you know, civility and the ferocity of primal life, the whole idea is built into the nervous system. It is built in not just in some humane way, as you know, but it's the basis of polarized energy running a three-dimensional world. That, that's simply it at the ordinary level for two-dimensional minds. There's this idea religiously, scientifically, otherwise. I mean, you get as far away from science as you can, the difference between the expanding and the shrinking universe. That you can go all the way, from, you know, run it from the uh, Upanishads and ideas of the Hindus that we're here in creation and we're simply between what? Bus stops. No. So you should have read your religious literature. We're between the God... Inhaling and exhaling, bring it up to date, and what do we have? The Big Bang, that the universe is expanding, or either I've got my telescope turned around the wrong way, there's mayonnaise on the eyepiece, because to me, to me, the electromagnetic spectrum has been torted in some way. I see the universe not rushing away, but it seems to be coming toward me. In fact, I don't like it. It's coming too fast, because the way it's going now, another 50 billion years, and we could be history. <laughs> just pointing out that the, the idea of an ultimate struggle an ultimate battle is not gone away it's not gone away in life it has not gone away in your nervous system because you could be as far removed from the religious idea that someday there's going to be some great uh, apocalyptic battle between good and evil you can get as far away from that as you want to and you're still left with hey either universe and they say that they're divided up into nice, decent camps. They're not out in tents and you know, sweaty tambourines and sawdust on the floor. These guys are scientists. But it's the same thing. They're debating now instead of good and evil and whether Satan or Jehovah is going to win. They're debating, all right, because it's got to be one of the two. Well, I know there's somebody else. Every now and then it pops up. Somebody says, how about a static universe? And they say, ah, shut up. Because nobody's interested in the third possibility. Right now, it is it's still between good and evil between the guys with the white hats and the guys on the black horses. You figured out. That either the universe is expanding and everything's all right, you know, as much as it can be being a cosmologist without tenure. You know. <laughs> but anyway, the universe is expanding or is shrinking, right? So it is built in, to, it is the basis, it's inescapable, of a three-dimensional world being run by polarized energy, by binary energy, that there is whatever they want to call it, you cannot get away from it. It's the heart of everything. Are you ready? The idea of some ultimate battle between something, if nothing else, between the truth and error, between us progressing and being intellectual creatures or beginning to slide downhill and you know, becoming as dumb as Jesus knows what, a reporter or you know, somebody. So... With that established, we're back to it because this is one that Kairu has never pointed out in this particular way. This one part of one guy's brain, his intellect, is taking the other part. He's saying, if this thing that many people believe, if an ultimate batter, battle ever does pl take place, he says, don't take sides because if this happens, which it's not, but if this happens, they're both going to lose because what it would be would be what some of them, the doomsayers, believe. That would be the end of everything. If you take it in a religious sense, which uh, I'm sure all of you can do your own symbolic versions of it and take it out of grammar school, but if good and evil finally end up out there on the battlefield, neither one's going to win because all it is is the destruction of a three-dimensional universe. Or if the cosmologist said, well, all right, what we're dealing with here, there's got to be a final showdown either with the theory, the possibility that the universe is expanding, either that or it's shrinking back on itself. So you guys got there and fought it out. Fit, which every theory is correct, or just in a broader, broader scope, if it gets down to the fact, the intellectual battlefield of truth or error, are we actually progressing, or are we just creatures stumbling around? We got a small intellect. We can talk a little bit, but Jesus, all we're doing is stumbling from one stupid epoch to another one. We're not getting anywhere. Yeah, we got better clothes and got faster cars, but internally, you know, where it counts in our soul, in our spirit, we're devolving. You know, next thing you know, we'll be a cheap band from Akron, Ohio. <laughs> well.
if it comes down to an ultimate battle between anybody, what you're talking about is you're talking about the binary energy that keeps this alive. It won't be the you know, end of the universe, but if it happened, it would be the end of this. That is, it would be the end of the spectators. It would be the end of those that could be conscious of, all right, here it comes. We've waited on it as the final showdown between truth and error. If it comes and you watch it, don't take sides because when it says they'll both lose, what it means is, you understand? Don't waste your money. You're dead. They both lose. It's the end of everything. Here. Of course, those of you majoring in philosophy, go to the bathroom. No. <laughs> go get a beer. No. Do you, do you see why? No one can describe what is truth and what is error. Or, those that want to push it a little bit further, that say, well, by God, I'm very close to knowing what it is. I could have been on the Supreme Court because I may not know what it is, but I know it when I see it. That's pornography, sir. Oh, well, I thought it was the truth. Do I have my choice? Do I get to see some pornography or the truth? Show him out. But why it is that even though people cannot define People cannot describe, there can be no agreement, even amongst those with doctoral degrees in philosophy from a reasonable school, not some night school. Even they cannot agree exactly what the truth is. But even those that say, well, I may not be able to describe it exactly, but there's no doubt it does exist. And nobody can get any further. Well, that's 3,000 years old. That's not some major breakthrough for a man to say, well, I may not be able to describe exactly what it is, but I can tell you this. There is no doubt that some sort of basic truth does exist. And they can go on from there and distract themselves and you. But no one can get any closer. Why? I just told you. If they got any closer, it would self-destruct. It's never going to get any closer. And so there is the feeling that there is this ultimate battle. But notice it's always the ultimate battle, which is conveying the idea of the future. If you said there will be an ultimate battle, when was it? Well, it wasn't yesterday. It wasn't this afternoon. It's always, well, it's coming. It's coming. Check your watches. Come on. Do 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 do. Okay, this is one, I know Kairut's run this by about three times. Some of you who weren't listening may have thought that he was repeating himself, but he was not. It had to do that Kairut noted. There was, uh, if you didn't notice, one of the threads running through tonight had to do with time. And so this is still somewhere, in fact, the one before it is Kairut gave a tip on the fourth race. If that has anything to do with the number of dimensions around here, you figured out. It says, some rebels have expressed suspicion regarding the propriety of sequential time. Followed by, Kairut noted this, related, necessarily, anachronistic rebels update of an old city proverb. And as I said, I know he's done the proverb before the old one, I assume you all know by now. The old proverb, the original was, lay down with dogs, get up with fleas. You know, which is if you live in Oklahoma, Nebraska, if your mama saying, you know, hang around people who drink and get in trouble, expect the same thing. You, know, you can't lay down with dogs and get up and think, what the hell am I doing with fleas? Right? Okay. The encounter has done several versions, but now having to do with what seems to be ordinary people, the inescapable aspect, not to even mention the question of any propriety, any usefulness, but the inescapable aspect of the sequentialness of time. He's pointing out that a rebel would have to have another version, even of this, this is like the third or fourth one that Kyra's done on this. To ever escape the limitations of linear existence, linear existence, a revolutionist must somehow be able to, and here's the update, to lie down with fleas and to get up with dogs. Which, if we're not going to get around to it, I refer you to the last one of the night that Kairou defines the revolution one more time as genes running uphill. Forget morality. Forget, well, if you lay down uh, with somebody who has... Uh, an unfashionable social disease, then don't be surprised that if later you experience some unpleasantness when you go to the restroom if you're a man. <laughs> In other words, forget the morality of lay down with dogs, get up with fleas. 
take it somewhere else. That you have got to run evolution as it would appear in a three-dimensional world. You've got to run it in the way you since words are two-dimensional, this doesn't really cover it, but to give some hint, as always, you have got to run not just evolution backwards, it's really in another direction. It's somewhere outside that you can point of height, breadth, and width, because they've already pointed out to us, hey, don't look at us. It's not our fault. <laughs> but you would have to be able to draw like a three-dimensional figure on two-dimensional paper, and then running through that in a perpendicular direction, that is perpendicular to all three, including time, if you're really sharp, somewhere else. That would be genes running uphill. That would be what would be required for a person individually here to escape from the lineal, the sequential circumstances, limitations of what seems to be one lifetime. And I'm not talking mystical about live again, all that crap. But if you're going to fight about, well, here I am, and you can't seem to override your hormones, I can't seem to do enough, and you know, when am I going to repent? You know, you're already done for. It would be, Kairos was pointing out, that somehow you would have to be able to very symbolic here, go out with a symbolism. You got to be able to lay down with fleas and get up with dogs. All right, if we're off the air, how about no one? Be able to be able to climb up on the table with a Frankenstein monster, and when you get up, oh you got a bunch of cheap parts. <laughs> Maybe you put them back together and make a remote, you know, for your C D player. <laughs>